Hi there, welcome back. This is uh, for those of you who thought maybe I'd given up on tube radio restorations. I've got another one for you today. And um, strangely enough, this might not look like a tube radio, but it is. This is a Philips 22RB382 from 1968. And as far as I've been able to determine, it's probably one of the last tube sets made by Philips. I've looked around, I can't find one later than this. So this one has got quite a high interest factor in itself. Now, it has FM, short wave, long wave and medium wave, plus a tape or gramophone input. Um, the FM on this one goes from 88 to 104. So this is a sign of it uh, being a bit more recent. We see one speaker on the left there. This front is plastic in very, very good condition, which is great. All the knobs are in good condition, except quite a bit, bit of dirt around them. So easily restorable. The covering is actually, it's not, um, this isn't wood, this is actually a plastic and it has a pretty bad uh, crack over there. This really belongs to a friend of mine whose mother had it, I believe, and was given uh, the radio by her father. So this is now going into the hands of third generation, which is great. And I believe his plan is to build or cover this up with uh, solid wood, which is fairly easy once you take the radio out. Looking at the back, there's nothing particularly unusual. We have the uh, in, uh, FM antenna socket there, dipole. Down below we have the AM antenna with the earth and the antenna sockets. This is the input, it's a DIN connector for the gramophone or tape, uh, tape deck. There we have the reference number and model number. Input voltage selector set to 220 and that's about it. Now again the back also other than a bit of dust and dirt and grime is in perfect condition which is great because these plastic sets sometimes come to you cracked and there is not much you can do about that except trying to hide it. So this one should be quite nice and um, it is a tube set it's a fully it's a full tube radio there's uh, one exception in that there's four uh, germanium diodes in the detector circuits. Other than that, it uses um, tubes. So let's open up and see what we've got. Okay, here we go. This thing is uh, pretty easy to remove from the cabinet. And um, on this particular radio, I'm not going to put it on that um, assembly because I think it's easy enough to work on it as it is. It's actually still stuck to the front panel. And let's have a look at the details. We've got ourselves a speaker over there, which is connected to the grill. We'll leave that in place because it, uh, it's fairly easy to work with. There's quite a bit of dust and yeah, mostly dust on here. Power transformer, output transformer. This thing uses the, um, yeah, that's the output tube. It uses a ECL 86 which is a combination of uh, triode and pentode. So it has a preamp and power amp in one. Those are pretty good, but becoming a little expensive to replace. I hope that's in good shape. That thing there is a, what is it? A EF89. So that's between the two IF cans. That's an IF transformer, an IF amplifier tube. We have the mixer oscillator over here. ECH81, which is very common with these sets. And then internally inside this metal cabinet is the FM section. We have an ECC85, which is quite typical as well. Then the ferrite antenna for AM. And the detector circuits, which will happen after this second IF transformer. The detectors, instead of using tubes, they use uh, uh, germanium diodes. So it makes the whole thing, well, one at least one tube smaller. We have a fuse on here. There's a fuse down there. 
everything is very dusty, but I don't think anybody has been in here, which is good news. It's always easier to fix it from scratch. Now I'm going to turn it over so we can see what we can see on the underside. Again, no signs of tampering down here. This is the, that'll be the on off switch and, and volume pot. Tone control over there. A few electrolytics. That'll be changed. That resistor looks pretty blackened, but we'll see when we open it up. This section here is the sensitive stage is covered up by this panel. We'll have to take that off. If we look at this end, we've got the tuning side. This will be the AM because the FM is inside the middle can. And everything seems to be fairly intact. And this thing over here is actually the selector switch. As you turn the button on the underside, it moves across and makes your contacts. So we'll have to see how that is. Well, that cover came off very, very easily and we get a look at the remainder of the circuit that was hidden. Um, mostly ceramic capacitors and a few electrolytics. So there are no paper caps on this thing that I can tell. There are a few of those mustardy ones that sometimes go bad, but very, very rarely compared to the the other paper ones, these are pretty good. So I am going to have to sort of power this up and see what's what and then we'll decide how to take it from there. Now he tells me that this was switched on recently and it just makes a noise and there is no sound. So it's been powered up recently without any major explosions. I do notice that that resistor is indeed pretty black and something has been drawing a lot of current there um, but it has been powered up recently it does make a noise so I'm actually inclined to power this up with the dim bulb tester just to see if we can establish what is working for now we'll see I'll have another look at it and I'll tell you what I decide to do Right, I'm inclined to try this. I'm going to put the dim bulb just on one lamp. I'm going to put it on medium wave, see if we can get the benefits of the ferret antenna. I have the antenna hooked at the back just to see what we get. And I'm going to switch on the dim bulb and um, Well, here goes nothing. Um, see what happens. Dial lamps have come on. The dim bulb is drawing current. It's actually drawing 70 milliamps and it's dropped the line voltage to 208. So it's not drawing excessive current. I have just the one bulb on, the 40 water. So this is at maximum restriction. If I give it a bit more, now those two are on, they're very very dim, you can't see it because it's only drawing 100 milliamps. Oh, we've got some noise. Yeah, we've got some hum. Oui. Okay, at volume minimum, volume pot is really dirty but there is quite a bit of hum so the filter caps will probably need changing tone control is dirty as well Let's see if we can get anything on here no long wave we're hearing the noises so the oscillator and everything else seems to be working picking up anything. Shortwave. Now FM. No, well 
I'm not going to stress it anymore. But what have we discovered? The power supply is working. The power transformer is working. The output transformer is working. The speaker is working. The power amp is working because we're getting noise. The oscillator, or rather the radio section, the RF section, seems to be making the right noises because we're getting the hiss coming through on top of that hum. Um, so I don't think there's too much dramatically wrong with this radio. Um, but I'm going to take it one step at a time. I'm going to sort out the, the power section, the power supply section, and move forward from there as I usually do. So power supply, then the, the power amplifier, and then go to the radio section, usually AM first and then FM. Um, I have a, I've got a pretty comprehensive um, service manual for this thing, which happens to be in three languages, including English, English, Dutch and French, I believe. So it should be fairly easy to, to work through this. And uh, I don't have it in front of me now, but the actual schematic and, and service or the schematic itself and the layout, the, uh, the physical layout drawings are very, very clear for a change. Well, looking at the schematic here, a few things become immediately apparent. And the um, first one is that it has a uh, safety cap, filter cap, from the mains line to ground. Now, normally, sometimes it's actually across the mains coming in, but this one is to ground. So this thing normally you would replace or remove, you'd put a safety cap in. However, what I have found is that it's a ceramic uh, capacitor and it's a 1K kilovolt capacitor, which is probably fine. Um, so I'm going to leave that in for now. The other thing is that this has got a 220 volt setting and a 240 volt setting. And because we're closer to 240 volts here now than we were to 220, that's the first thing I'm going to change. So all you do is you rotate that guy to 240 make sure it's properly seated so that'll give us a slightly lower output from the transformer which is probably a good thing because what you will notice is that there seems to be quite a bit of charring on here this thing has seen quite a bit of heat and we know it's working because we heard the noise but it's been through the wars there's quite a bit of heat over there and my guess is that probably um, some part of the circuit was drawing too much current and we'll have to find out what that is there's that safety cap these things are pretty robust so I'm going to leave them in there the other thing is um, and I'll show you the schematic now there's a rectifier and the rectifier bridge rectifier is this thing over here very small little bugger, but you can see quite clearly that um, it's taking the AC output. That's one of the AC outputs. That's the other one. This thing here is probably ground, and there's your positive. So this thing is um, it's a very small little guy, and there's actually very little clearance between these two pins over there. So let's give it a bit more. Make sure it doesn't short out anywhere. One thing you've got to be careful when you do this is we, we determine that the power supply is actually working. You've got to be careful you don't mess it up while trying to fix it. So that's the first thing. We've changed that input to 240. Um, we're leaving that in there. We know this thing's drawing a bit too much current or has been in the past. We'll get to that because if you recall, there's a pretty burnt out resistor underneath. And I think I have a clue as to where that comes from. So back to the schematic. We've checked this all here. We've adjusted that to 240. Now we go one step further. What we have is the high voltage, uh, 200 volts coming out here, 200 volt AC and 6.3 volts. That's the heater voltage over there. And um, that's pretty normal. This is actually fairly low. Usually it's uh, probably the same as the, the line voltage, the mains voltage coming in there. So this ends up usually being a one to one more or less, but this is 200 volts. There's another safety cap across here. We'll have to check if that is a if that is the ceramic as well or not. Actually, I believe the one I've just shown you is this one over here. 
and this one must be on the underside by the switch. So that's going to stay in there. That's the rectifier I mentioned, one side to ground. So the negative is ground and then there's your positive coming out. Um, this 6.3 volts uh, heater voltages goes to the heaters of the, uh, the tubes. Uh, there's actually a filter. This is a, some sort of filter to make sure that these two tubes on the end get a clean supply without RF on there because they're obviously the more sensitive parts of the schematic. And then we have three lamps, dial lamps, um, which are actually quite strange when you look at them on the, on the board. Let me show you. These are the dial lamps. They're little 8 volt lamps, usually the sort you see on a Christmas tree light. There's another one and there's another one. Now these guys, I believe at least some of them are, uh, are not burnt out because we did see light when this thing came on. These things are actually soldered to the uh, heater supply on the one hand, which is the green wire, and then to the chassis, which is ground on the other one, which is exactly what we see on the schematic. So, so far, we've got ourselves to the output of the rectifier and we've checked where that uh, the lamps go to. Now, let's go back to the schematic. As is quite normal, right on the output of the rectifier, you'd have a, micro, a filter cap. This one is a dual filter cap, 50 microfarads times two. The first one is on the output there. Then you get your 70 milliamps filtered by the first filter cap coming out of here. Goes up here, goes into the output transformer. Um, then that feeds the anode of the uh, the power part of the uh, ECL86 which is normal as well that also there's actually a snubber circuit between them which is to cut off high frequencies with a 15k and a 3n3 I believe that's 3k3 is uh, 3300 picofarads that would cut off some of the uh, very high frequencies from going into the output then there's part of the transformer that part, that little part there, acts as a sort of a choke. It then comes through that 1K resistor, and that's your second B plus line, which is also filtered by that same filter cap, the other half of the uh, 50 microfarad filter cap. So, first thing we're going to do is check this capacitor, see if uh, we know there's something wrong. We know it's buzzing like crazy and it's hum. Um, so, the first thing to do is check what this cap reads like, and then take it from there. So I'm going to use the SR meter and connected the one to ground, this, these caps all reference to ground, and test that one there. And what we get is 0.5 ohms. Now, for a 50 microfarad at 400 volts, it's probably 50 micro, it's 0.8, so it's not too bad actually. Um, going lower yeah it's not too bad it's probably not that bad let's check the second one that's where we have a problem it's not reading at all and what I notice is that the lead in there coming out of the cap is actually cracked the whole bottom of the cap is uh, is bubbled somewhat. You can't really see too well on there and I can't really focus that much but um, it actually seems to have it's been breaking apart for some time so that filter cap is definitely gone and now I have to decide whether I leave I'm gonna I want to leave the outside in there definitely for aesthetics but I'll probably try and find a way of either I'll either re refill it with new caps or I'll find a way of putting two caps on the underside and I probably will opt for the second option because this can is quite small. I don't think it'll take 247 in my case, 47 microfarad capacitors, 450 volts. I don't think it'll hold two of them in there. So I'll probably just put it on the underside and that'll explain one of these capacitors and I think it's the second one. Or is it the first one? Um, yeah, this is the first one. This is coming from this wire. 
This red wire is the one that comes from the transformer, uh, rather from the uh, selenium recti from the rectifier, from the bridge rectifier. It comes the first filter cap. It then goes straight on the yellow wire to the um, transformer, as you've seen before. So that one is filtering, and the second one, which is the one that's going to be filtering the more sensitive part of the circuit, the second B+, is doing nothing at all. And that would explain why we have this horrendous hum when we switch this thing on. So that's the first task. While we're here, I also notice something. If you recall, we saw that resistor. That resistor there has seen some hardship. It's uh, pretty black in the middle there. Now, what I can tell from looking at this and not even looking at the schematic just yet, this is the output tube and that would be the cathode resistor. Um, yeah, that would be the cathode resistor from the power tube, which should be 150 ohms. Now, one, one five. Yeah, that's 150 ohms. Now, it has across it the uh, bypass capacitor of 100 microfarad. Now, this capacitor is completely grungy on there. It's literally spilling its guts. So, we may well have a short, or this capacitor may well be partly shorting that part of the circuit. Not completely, because it is making noise, but it would contribute to an excessive current draw uh, because it would bias this thing out. It'll mess up the bias on this tube, probably create an excessive current draw. And of all the tubes on here, this is the one that will draw the most current, or this part of the tube is the one that will draw the most current, which could well be the reason why that um, power transformer seems to have seen quite a bit of uh, abuse. So my guess is that's the main problem with the excessive current draw. We've already reduced the, the voltage coming in, or rather we've set it to 240 volts, which means that um, the resulting voltage from the output of the, of the, of, from the secondary of transformer will be slightly lower. So we've improved that in that regard, we've improved it already, and now we'll check what we can do there. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to sort out these uh, filter caps. I'm probably going to go straight ahead and swap out that capacitor. There's another. There aren't that many capacitors to swap out here. As you can probably see, I would imagine we're looking at one, two, not much else. I mean, these guys, these are all ceramics. These ceramic caps normally don't go off. There's another one. There are quite a few capacitors here, but they're mostly ceramics. Or the dog bone ones, which never go off. Um, or the polyester ones, like polystyrene ones, that never go off. I say never, but you should never say never. But generally, they, they hold, a, hold up quite well. Here's another ceramic. Um, these guys here, these are actually quite modern. These mustardy ones. So I think this will probably be fine. What I'm going to do is I'm going to test a few of these mustardy ones and see whether the values hold up or whether there's leakage. I'll check the leakage as well. If a few of them are fine, then I would assume most of them are fine. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to do a quick recapping and then um, I'll come back to you with the result. We'll power it on again and see what we get. All right. Bye for now.